Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing today? Uh, like Nate said, feel free. I'm watching the chat. I'll try to catch things here and there. Uh, welcome to my office for about the last uh, year that's going on uh, here at the University of Maryland, which is actually my basement office because I've spent more time here than I have actually on campus since taking the job back in 2019. A little bit of background of me. Yes, I am a paramedic. I am an educator. Uh, I have a master's degree in EMS, emergency health services, specifically in EHS uh, education. But what kind of brings me on to talk to you about this is my undergrad is from the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, in a program called Biomedical Photographic Communications. Uh, there is audio um, going on, so we should probably check uh, speakers if there's any issues and you may want to contact Nate. Uh, so what that allowed me to do is not only uh, in terms of biomedical photographic communications, long term, uh, it essentially trained us and educated us to go work in hospitals to be their graphics and art department. Uh, but I love EMS, I love medicine, and I love teaching. I've been lucky to take and combine all these together. So this cheated developing visual case studies kind of looks at the idea of, of breaking away from the standard PowerPoint. And I think now that's even more important than, than ever before in that um, we don't really have a lot of interaction. So how can we pull out other ways to interact with our students? So this is one way of creating these visual case studies. It's also a really neat way to present information to allow students to build on as well as to query the, uh, the audience to kind of see where they're at. Because when we start to teach, we don't really want to teach everything that they already know. Uh, so we have to do a little bit of an assessment. So this kind of allows us to do that. And this whole cheated program really is nothing from me. I, I came across this uh, writing the textbook for uh, um, Rich Beebe as well as Jeff Myers, that paramedic series that they did. And they want us to follow this cheated method in terms of, of how we laid out our uh, presentation. So the cheated stands for chief concern, history, examination, assessment, treatment, evaluation, and disposition. Now, any of you that are like documentation gurus, this may look familiar because this is a documentation style. And they had me write the entire textbook using this. And as I'm writing, I'm like, this is a really interesting way to present information educationally. Is there a way we can take this and, and bring it into a slide deck, into a presentation? Now, I've taken this since then, I've taken this and turned it into other types of educational delivery material, but using the same concept. And this presentation really goes back to some of my first days at NAMC in terms of teaching back in like 2009, 2010 with Greg Freeze, where we would teach an entire workshop called uh, Effective Enhanced Visual Communications. I can't really remember. It's a while ago, it's almost 10, I can't believe it. it's almost been 10 years and if Greg is on here, um, you know, he's really what brought me in. But uh, so we take this down, we start off with this thing called Chief Concern. And what we're going to do under the chief concern, it starts to set up the case for the learners. It begins to evolve the information. It begins to look and see, do they understand those, those key things that need to happen prior to and upon arrival to the scene? So when we start to do this, well, how do we build it? Well, one way to look at building it is this, you know, it's taking like a checklist or a, if any of our educational circles, a scaffolding device and, and using this to kind of guide what we're doing. Oops, hang on, wrong button. And guide what we're doing. Hang on, let me turn on my pen here for a minute. There we go, okay. So taking this and, 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 and looking at the information that we would want to present and, and put that as our, our headers. So almost like laying out our PowerPoint, because you can actually set this up in PowerPoint and make these our headers and scene size up. And what would they, 
we expect the students to know. So it may be that uh, you're dispatched for a uh, motor vehicle crash. So guys, before we get going, what's going through your head? What are you thinking about? Tell me about it. And what this does is it allows the students to begin teaching the material in a, a social cultural theory uh, way of teaching. And, and it moves the instructor from being a, you know, the all being, all knowing entity to the uh, guide on the side, to more of a facilitator. So they'll allow them, the students to kind of drive that. So we, when we look at the, the process, this is a really great way. And there's different ways of presenting this. What are some other things that we would want to kind of pull from our students that maybe then we wouldn't have to spend a, time, a, lot, a ton of time teaching about in this early stage? Well, let me ask you this. What do we want to know in terms of dispatch? What should our students know? I gave you a little bit of an example, but what can we use in terms of dispatch? Why is dispatch information so important to have to begin our scenario? It does set the scene a bit. Oh, I like that, James. Start thinking about extra resources. Excellent. Still keep an open mind. It allows them to really delve into things and start thinking at that broad, some critical thinking. And you can start to challenge your students uh, if it gets dispatched with a specific type of uh, call complaint, like chest pain. So we can start going through all the different causes of chest pain, start their, 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 their differential diagnosis as you may go. So we're all causes of chest pain, boom, 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 boom. Okay, yeah, that's nice, but do we really care about that? No, we care about the things that are gonna kill them. So that's where this can come in. And if they don't answer or they just sit there going, we're gonna assume they don't know anything and we're gonna have to teach that. But if they all come up, boom, 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 do we need to repeat that? Do we need to go through that? No, they have a great understanding of it. So we're gonna use this whole process also as an assessment tool, dynamic assessing. So we move on to the arrive on scene. So what are we looking for here? And this is why it's so important for it to be a visual case. Scene safety, okay, excellent. So we can, we can have photographs of, of a scene that's unsafe or maybe not safe. Because we all know, students walk in and go, scene safety, BSI, uh, you know, and they just keep moving. Or they go, the scene is safe. And I like to ask my students and I look at them when they say, the scene is safe. I'm like, is it? Sick, not sick, love it. Uh, from them to look at a picture, identify concerns, number of patients. So that's the key thing. All these things we talk about, we, we have in bullet points. So open up any of your uh, publisher produced material and there's be a whole bunch of bullet points that tell us this. But that's just telling the student. But if we make the students look at these images and to take and make concerns and, and, and decisions based on it, it's really, really important to look and judge their knowledge. Having pictures of all different types, all different angles is important. This might go my, my scene safety issue. I miss him, he has a big dog, big, big old boy, that's Bowie. And uh, we can do these in many different ways. So if we go back, you know, to here, you know, it's first person. We're, we're looking, we are the providers, we are the responders. And there's gonna be different ways. We'll show you different ways throughout here of, of, of how to photograph a, a, a scene or how to photograph it. But this is from first person, I like to call it first person. You're seeing it from how you would see if you walked into the home. Then we move on to our general impression. And as we move into our general impression, we want to look at the idea as well, 
going back to our sick, not sick um, information. So you can put all that together. So you don't need to have each one of these steps in there. You don't need to have each one of these uh, subsections. It really depends on what you're, what you're going for and what you're trying to demonstrate. So you can take bits and parts of to use based on what you're teaching. So like in here, this is a, a simple uh, photograph of a friend of mine laying in a bed. And if you're not friends with Photoshop or someone who is knowledgeable of Photoshop, you should, because it's real easy to do a lot of things. This is a simple, this is, if we look at her arms here, all it is is just a simple, what we call a motion blur filter. It takes about three seconds to do. It's not all that difficult. You know, we can look at, at the concept of what does, um, what are some concerns here? What are some things to look at? Again, all, and these can be used for different things. This could be used for a seizure, this picture. This is a great looking subject on the ground. I know it. If you need his autograph, let me know. I, I have his contact information. But this could be used for a seizure. This could be used for unresponsive. This could be used for an overdose. So that's kind of neat part is, is whatever this picture is, it's what you say it is. Expensive model. Yes, he is. I tell you. Expensive or expansive. Okay, good. Expensive. I'm getting nervous there for a minute. You know, i got that COVID-10 going on right now. Uh, but it allows us to get into, as the students. So then we move from our general patient impression into our chief complaint. Again, we're walking up. Her, she's 18 today, by the way, boys and girls. She is 18. She's my nephew, my niece. It's scary. Anyways, so what does it, what's wrong with her right now? What would this tell you? What's her chief complaint? And it's a visual chief complaint. It's the first contact with her or with the patient. And it allows us to introduce a more specific complaint later on. Uh, hand or wrist injury, okay, abdominal pain, scared. So you can see is that based on the call information, this bench information, you can utilize these pictures for a lot of different things. This was originally for stomach pain and, and Ruth, that's great. I never thought of the hand or wrist injury. I'm gonna have to keep that. I gotta find that in my, in my uh, collection here, but that's a great use of it. Uh, these images, if you, uh, I photograph all these, it's not hard. Now, nowadays with our, our cameras and iPhones, they're making better pictures than my, my film camera was when I was in school. Um, you wanna have the patient, what I call visually complaining. So like chest pain, you know, Levine sign, um, uh, shortness of breath, put them in a tripod position like we saw earlier on. Uh, nausea, vomiting, you know, they can look like this. Uh, pain, she's in pain here. Those are all real important things to do. And your subjects make need to be really good actors and kind of talk them through it. Uh, my joke always was, is like, look sad. I don't know how to look sad. Think of dead puppies. Ooh. And then they think of that. Uh, and, and kids are, are tough, you know, actors, but they, they, a lot of them are real hams and they really enjoy it. Uh, if you are working with kids, try to keep the parent aside because parents always want the kids to perform and it just makes it a nightmare trying to photograph them. You know, this is one I use a lot. I've used this a lot in terms of, of the EPC program. My trauma courses, this is regarding regression of kids uh, in, in terms of, of injuries. So great little actors. She's 18. He's 14, by the way, it's my son. Um, <laughs> it's just always, he's supposed to be unresponsive, but everyone looks at him and goes, he's laughing. I'm like, I don't know, maybe he's having, he's unconscious and, and telling himself a joke. I don't know. So that's the hard part, but we're always looking at it. Get in there, get tight. So then once we get into it, now we move into the initial assessment. We get into the, the ABCs, our primary assessment, you know, uh, looking and evaluating our patient and really depending on the scenario, um, you can be a uh, very detailed or minimal. My suggestion is if you go and do this and, and go to photograph, photograph more than what you need because you'll use this at other, on other scenarios later on and other PowerPoints later on. It makes life a heck of a lot easier. Uh, the more photographs you have, I have photographs I've never used and I'm pulling out and dusting off going, this would make a great, great use. 
Um, and it also allows you to adapt it for the learner. So I would do one set ALS, one set BLS. So one set without any EKGs, one set with EKGs on it. So they'll understand and see that based on, on the class that you're dealing with. You can do step by step or you can go side by side. So here's one where I just took it and just added a little image on top of it. About placing airways and, and managing airways. Um, don't worry, she doesn't have a nasal airway in. Uh, these cut really easy. I have a whole collection of props. So it's only about this much of the nasal airway. It looks, it, it's all magic. It's all magic. It comes in. I have to have a whole set of oral airways. So he, that oral airway there is, it's really hard to cut an oral airway, but you can do it safely. Um, but it's all cut down. So all they need to do is put it in their mouth and bite down. Same with endotracheal tubes. We don't want to be in the movies or, or, or the, uh, the TV shows where you see the person with the endotracheal tube like this. You know, cut it down, make it the right size. It looks like it would be in real life. Uh, same thing with angiocatheters. Uh, we don't really need to start IVs on people. Take the angiocatheter, cut the catheter off, put it on their arm, put the tegaderm over. No one's going to know. Matter of fact, as you put the tegaderm down, it's going to take the catheter and it's just going to depress into the skin a little bit and it's actually going to look like it's inserted. Somewhere in here, we, we may want to talk about uh, putting... Oh, and let me go back to this one here for one second. So this was really an interesting thing. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on. But he did not want any makeup on. He refused. So all his injuries and bruises are digital. Again, Photoshop can be your friend. It's not real hard with some practice. These are what we call layers. And also, you can see here, he's got a little deformity. And the nice part is... And I've used this picture or similar pictures without him in moulage. And it was nice because I didn't want to have all those injuries on. So I can use him as a trauma scenario like this, or if he has no injuries, I mean, he's got the blood coming from his mouth on this one, but if he has no injuries, then I can use him as a seizure or, 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 or uh, uh, a plugged uh, CSF shunt. So there's different things we, you can do by not really over moulaging your patients. The more you can do digitally, the better. We talk about vital signs uh, and depending upon your, your audience, you can do something very simple like this. Uh, you can do what we call a um, progressive disclosure that only, only one of these comes up at, at a time. Bits and parts, you can be creative. You can use tables for this. Um, I have a collection. I photographed the front of a monitor and these are all blank. So you see everything but the numbers. So none of these are on here. And I have rhythm strips. I have numbers I can put on there so I can take my monitor and make it say what I want to say. And I can even animate it by having these appear. There's different things you can do. You can even do this in PowerPoint. Um, there's no reason why you need to be in Photoshop for this. You can do this right in PowerPoint. So go and take a photograph of one of your monitors turned on, but with nothing running. And then there's your picture, use that Anytime you go to talk about vital signs or rhythms, um, you can make you can make your your your, your waveforms right in PowerPoint. So you don't need to have Photoshop for a lot of it. You can do it right in PowerPoint. You can get creative and get all sorts of fanciness. Um, you know, this is just my little graphic representation about blood pressure and, and treatment and vital signs. Be careful though because sometimes you're not thinking about it because it's not a real patient. Watch out for the uninflated uh, nominee breather if you're getting ready to put it on somebody. So I have found a lot of issues over the, over the years going, oh, I missed that. And Greg was notorious for doing this. He goes, when would you do a CPR with glasses on somebody? I'm like, oh, I never thought of it. So focused on everything else. It's those little minute details, which it would help probably if you have people to help you. So I to do nothing but watch just the medical side of things. You deal with the, uh, the photographs, have someone else deal with the medical. Which leads us to patient history. So the H is our next section here. And here we're going to talk about past medical history, social history, family histories, as well as our history of present illness. And there's a lot of different ways you can do it. 
One thing is I love to have just that provider, that mother talking to me, the father talking to me, the caregiver talking to me. Uh, I just used one of these just the other day to be the mom for a, a SIDS case I was teaching. So the baby was, was a completely separate case, a separate set of photographs, but you didn't know because it was just like this. You didn't see the background or the context. It is what it is. And that's the whole nice thing. Um, yep. Oh, yep. Jared, excellent point using um, YouTube to play lung sounds. Uh, and that is awesome. Especially if you can hide the, um, the, the, the title, you may also be able to uh, just add in where it plays in the background, potentially even. And that may be something too, where you could hide it. If it has to play the video, you can hide it behind a photograph like this. There's different things you can, can do, but that's an excellent point there, Jerry. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so just different ways, you know, here she, she's thinking, she, she, she's contemplating going down the list. And I often use this in terms of, of going down my, my sample or my OPQRST history. Um, you can do something very simple. This is used a lot for uh, new learners. So just give them, you know, you know, the whole uh, basically breakdown of the history, or again, it could be a progressive disclosure where it, it just shows bits and parts as you're talking about it. You can get a little bit more graphic with it. Um, and, and really how you put it together is, is, is really up to you. This is one thing I do. This is a, a, a pediatric history gathering tool that I, I use. Um, siren sounds in the background. <laughs> yep. Um, the, uh, we definitely do that in our sim lab. So, you know, the chief complaint and, and it's just another way. And what will happen on this one is there's some animation built in. So you can stage this and build it. So you can have just the C arrive. So let's say that we've taught this before. Uh, so I can have just the C appear. And then what I would do is say, okay, what does C stand for? And if they answer it or don't answer it, I have the next part appear, chief complaint. All right, what are you looking for? Now, when we, um, now when we are looking at uh, the, uh, this part and this part here, we could do it in a couple of different ways. One is have it come down and give list all the things I would be looking for normally, or we can have it just reveal what is with our case. So that's a couple of different ways. If you're teaching this from the, for the first point or you're teaching a condition, you, you can have it come down and list everything that you would want to know that would be prevalent in, in this case, or it could be just what's prevalent to our current case. You know, our sample history, of course, you know, uh, how the feeling, um, you know, nausea is just a, a, a photograph, you know, for nausea, back of an ambulance, uh, just to just look sick and, and, and turn it green a little bit in the photograph. Um, this is one, I always kind of joke, this was one of Greg Fries's photographs. And I said, Greg, where did this come from? Because it's kind of a, it was in his image collection. He goes, oh, well, we we're just at the, uh, uh, we had a picnic or something at the fire station. So he just took pictures. So it brought up a really good point is what you can be doing is just have your camera and photograph stuff like this. And he had no intentions of it. He just said, this is kind of a neat thing. Let's take a picture. And it happened to be that we were doing a presentation on, on allergies and anaphylaxis. So here we go. Here's our, our seafood allergy. So by limiting as much of the background that you have, you can utilize this anywhere and through many different ways. You know, this is one I like to use in terms of, uh, you know, are they taking your medications? Are you not taking your, your medications? And this is what I kind of call the, the second person scenario where we're kind of like standing there, we're helping him out. Uh, so the first person is like what we've been seeing where the, you're interacting directly with, with the image. Second person is kind of like, all right, I, my partner's there. I'm over here doing this. And then the third person is what I like to call the fly in the wall photograph. Um, they're all good things depending on what you're going for. The nice part about doing second or third person is it starts to really kind of an, involve uh, the interaction of the provider and what they're doing. The box of meds, this is my generic box of meds. Make sure if you do do this, you, you 
don't have any identifying information, even if it's your own, uh, just kind of hide everything. Because then again, I can, you know, this in real life may have been, you know, uh, a beta blocker, but I'm going to say today it's going to be a calcium channel blocker. So if you don't have labels, if you don't have that stuff visible, it is what you say it is. And that's really one of the key things about doing a visual case study is it is what you see it is. Uh, go over to the local grocery store. Any of you do that simulation, you probably already have a bunch of these. Uh, actually, if any of you are already doing simulation and moulage and stuff, you're halfway there because you have a lot of toys. Now you just got to put it on film or show my age, digital. Uh, a set of um, medical alert tags is always good to have uh, to be able to put on there. You can see I've used it quite a bit. You know, history, last meal. I've used this image for my diabetic. I've used this image for uh, heat. I've used this image a lot of different ways. Uh, and again, because you don't know what this is, it could be anything I say it is for the scenario. If I don't include the, if I don't show what's on the other side. Events leading up to, um, it's always a good thing, which, because what you may do is you may go through the history and then say, okay, here's what, it's kind of like, you know those TV shows where they kind of show what's going on and then you, they go back in time a little bit to show you how they got there? That's kind of what this part of the history is. Uh, no, I did get that out of his mouth before he put it in there. Uh, I did get yelled at by my mom. Uh, what are you letting him do that for? Oh, I'm good at pediatrics. I'll get it out, maybe. <laughs> He's 14. You know, you know, how did you fall and break your femur? Well, he fell off the... Uh, fell off the ladder, just simple Photoshop, motion blur. And you can do that even in some parts, you can do it in, in PowerPoint as well. Uh, you can have a little bit of fun with it, you know, kind of make the picture of what's going on. This is why we don't stick knives in toasters. Uh, so we can have some fun at, at, um, as well. When we get into the history of the present illness, uh, it's really going to be this is where the learner starts to develop their list of differentials. And we'll get into those, we'll delve into those more once we get into the assessment section of this. Uh, so we get into the history of present illness, we get into the uh, OPQRST, and there's some different ways you can present it. This is one here where I kind of have the, the gentleman uh, working on his car and he's telling you, I was out working on the car when I started. So this is the, 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 what was going on and this is him just kind of looking at you and you'll notice his face stays here and i just changed the bubble I was playing ball this is something about uh i think difficulty breathing the funny thing is i think this this side set is from a pandemic lecture from like 10 years ago uh like radiation and now he's back in here i feel achy as well especially all my joints so really this picture here is the same one right here just use it and crop it. So feel free to reuse images that, that work for you because that's a key thing. I love to have little like voice prompts in there. Uh, severity and pain, uh, just combining a graphic in here, you know, the, the, the Wong uh, Baker faces and, and scale and, and the, the, young, the young boy, some of the severity. Time, you know, this is real simple. We know, okay, chest pain time. These two go together. This is just a graphical thing. Uh, you don't need to get fancy and have this, this clock in there, but by seeing that this clock is in here, as well as him, we know that those two kind of go together. And a lot of what we're using in terms of these photographs is also an association. So when we start talking time and you sit here and you're talking on time and lecturing on, you know, the time for history, this picture is going to become like superimposed with that. So that allows them to be able to find a visual way to find that information that they want to pull out. So there is some educational validity behind doing this. So then we move from history and we move into the examination. And this is really up to you and what you want to do and how in depth you want to get it. So we look at, you know, what is the case and what amount are we going to do and how much time do we want to spend on it? Uh, we may want to walk the students through step by step each assessment or just kind of expose them in a generalization to be able to talk about it. The focus on these images, we really want to be the meat and potatoes of that exam. 
And when we photograph these, and you'll see, really get your camera in there, get in close, make it relative, but you need to make sure it's recognizable what it is. Because um, if I shoot just like here, you would have really no idea if my body wasn't here, what that is, okay? Or what part of the arm, upper or lower arm or, or, or those things. So you wanna make sure you have joints in there and some identifiable, an, identifiable anatomical um, landmark. So with doing this, we can do just traditional casualty simulations. We can use moulage. Again, you'll be stuck with whatever that is uh, forever. So if they have, you see in this guy here, he's, he's got some wounds right there. He will always have those injuries no matter what. Same thing with this. Um, if I, you know, if by putting that seatbelt mark on there and then and moulage, uh, he'll always have that. Where if I put that in digitally, I can use this for so many different things. Another type of just, you know, traditional casualty sim. So any of you that are good at moulage, this is really a lot of fun and we enjoy, and as you know, enjoy it. So this way called traditional with, um, with digital casual, uh, digital casualty simulation. And what I mean about digital casualty is, is I alter the, the photograph. So yes, I sprayed her down with some water, but I made her pale digitally. I just desaturated it in, in the uh, software. So that's kind of the nice part about doing digital is I can make her pink. So I, I could turn her into a heat emergency or this was originally created for a diabetic emergency. This is also another thing. So as you know, any of you who do uh, simulation and moulage to get this type of injury, it takes a lot of time to get that looking good. I don't have that time sometimes. So the original photograph was, I just took the appliance, plopped it on his leg, put some blood on, took the photograph and then just used Photoshop to blend it in. So it saved a lot of time uh, uh, and, and effort. Same thing here, that's the original. I don't wanna spend a lot of time moulaging my foot. I think I, think I took a piece of uh, tape, <laughs> stuck it on my foot and then just took the photograph and digitally altered it. We may also be able to utilize this time of the exam so the exam is, is doing that, the head to toe exam, the physical exam, whatever we, we wanna call, however in depth we wanna get. But we also, because we are gonna use certain devices and certain types of equipment, this may be the time to teach that. So if you wanna teach glucometers or you do a glucometer review, this is a, a slide of uh, good and bad practice of using a glucometer. 2008, you can tell that picture is a little old. So it's the other thing is you may hide dates on stuff so it doesn't get, you know, time to, because there will be one person to call you out on that. But you can get into the equipment review. Uh, we can get into more of the, the um, in-depth assessment. This is why, this is a first person shot. So I didn't have anyone to come help me with this photo shoot, but I wanted to show that we we're checking pedal edema. So I'm here with my camera and then my hands coming out, checking it. And it's kind of nice because it kind of puts the viewer into that whole first person. Um, I am there feeling. So that's it for the examination. So the examination is the head to toe exam. It's what we're looking for to put together our differentials that now we're going to start talking about these. And when we get into the assessment section, this is where we have our differential diagnosis. And actually we start to discuss the actual diagnosis. And what we kind of do here is the assessment section says, okay, here's all the potentials that we have and really why they may or may not fit. And then we say, let's say we want to talk about um, myocardial infarction. So this has been a chest pain call. We've gone through the whole chest pain. Here's your differentials. You know, this is angina. This is Prince Metal's angina. Uh, this is, you know, pericarditis. And now this is myocardial infarction. And we're going to talk in depth about that. So this is the time to start talking about the pathophysiology. We may actually reuse some of our, um, our, uh, photographs from earlier on. We can go down through and start using um, uh, different types of, of ways to develop our differentials. This is called happy socks. This is what we use for uh, 
patients who are having trouble breathing to differentiate like pneumonia from heart failure, from asthma. Uh, and this is, I just kind of put up here, going back to earlier, like we had that um, uh, CIMP slide, I've used this in the exact same way. We can also talk epidemiology at this time, uh, start to explore uh, why this is, is such a uh, worthwhile topic to be learning. You can do something very simple by just saying, you know, just writing this out. The nice part about doing it like this without putting any numbers in, as numbers change, you don't have to change it. It's not so big of a thing now with digital, but back in the days, and some of you probably remember that you used to do slides and those were about 10 to $15 per slide. Uh, so you, you really didn't wanna have to change these if you didn't have to. Uh, there's ways to do um, graphical approaches. And this is just looking at epidemiology. You can do little bar graphs, put little images in them. You know, get creative, get away from slides of just words. Like I, I don't really have many of these. I think I had a slide set today of a hundred slides. I think maybe five of them had word, just word slides. You go back and it used to be about 70, 75% of, of your slide set were words only. So trying to get away and break away from that whole world of just using you know, words. So use graphics. It, it really starts to attach people and we are becoming much more visual. Uh, we can look at the pathophysiology and, and, and create things. This is just, this was really done easy. This was actually done in like Photoshop, but with PowerPoint now, you could do this. This is all stuff you could, you could illustrate in PowerPoint. It doesn't need to be fancy. Um, you know, one bit. When we talk about pathophysiology. This is, this is always my favorite. This is where we talk about uh, the sympathetic nervous system, you know, feeder, you know, feeder breed and you know here it is I'm, I'm eating and drinking I'm watching movies I probably shouldn't be watching making sure the kids aren't around and then the fire you know the fire alarm goes off I stand up real quick I get dizzy I get orthostatic so you you, you see that you see the whole thing and you can have fun with it and especially if it's a picture of you because uh, sometimes you are the best subject and you're the cheapest one out there uh, and the most available one out there uh, it's not a bad thing plus people get little giggles and chuckles on them we don't want to forget our ongoing, uh, an ongoing assessment or any type of assessment here. A lot of times what we'll do is list out all of the potential different types of things we may see uh, in the situation. So this is a, a lecture on asthma and we had gone through the case and presented the symptoms that that patient was having for the case. But now we say, okay, here are all the other signs and symptoms that, may, that you may encounter. And I always like to have a little, you know, hmm, what are you thinking? And this is the, this is kind of a, a good transition slide to have of like, all right, so we've done this, this, and this. You've seen this. Now, what do you want to do? What are our next steps? What's your treatment plan? And it kind of leads into that. And we move from the assessment. So we, we, we've gone through the chief complaint. We've gathered our history. We've gone through the examination of, of the patient, had to tell ALS, BLS, whatever you're teaching. We've gone into the assessment. We've talked about the differentials briefly, but we really delved into the, the main pathophysiology of whatever topic that we want to present. And then we take that knowledge and now we move into the treatment side of the world. Now, under the assessment or under the chief complaint, you would have addressed any life threats. So anything that they would find under the ABCs, that's where that is done because, well, that's where you would, that's where you would manage it. This is the treatment for everything beyond the life threats. Different ways to set your slides up. Uh, in the presentation, uh, this image is used to start to refresh the, the patient's memory of, of like, like mnemonics and acronyms and all those letters that we love to have. Uh, it gives us another chance to begin to interact with our family. Uh, and you can use quotes as well. So here it is here, this is, this is my slide I like to use for calling like med direction. Uh, the problem is, is stuff gets timely, you know, it gets dated, you know, back in the day when these were photographs, you know, high full action was like the thing for chest pain and where we were. And then it's like, no. So that's the one problem you run into. As standards change, it can also change your slide deck and change your image bank.
So just, you know, examples of treatment that we can have, sorry, an IV, I can, you know, this is an IO. Um, this is my son here. And uh, my wife, we're actually laying on the floor. I just had a white sheet. So it looks like he's on the stretcher. Again, my world, my rules. Uh, we just had a dish towel there. And by the way, this is uh, yellow food coloring. Yellow food coloring works great for beta I didn't have any. And we had the IO. I said, Holden, don't move. If you move, this is really going to hurt. No, I really did not do an IO on him. I uh, have an IO that doesn't have a needle in it. I pulled it out. And all I really did was just screw it to the end of the syringe and said, okay, just hold it against his leg. That's all. It's not really secured on there, uh, but it appears as, again, my world. You can do treatment progression if you have new folks. And let's say that you are uh, starting to talk about how to assemble like nebulizers, you know, put these together. You can actually do step-by-step. Again, even if you're not doing that step-by-step -step for that lecture, if you have it, photograph it, keep it in a, 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 a library because you may need that later on. You may want that later on. So a little bit by a little bit. And then it's just saline, of course, you know, we're not really giving our buterol. Sometimes though, you may not have the equipment that you want or need. Uh, so all I have right here is just a mouthpiece. There's no oxygen, there's no oxygen tubing attached. Um, but by photographing it really close uh, with it coming at the camera lens, my focus is, is on his face, which is going to make my what we call my, my depth of field shallow. So it's going to blur out this area. So it doesn't really matter. Nothing's coming out right now. Because my, my eye will go to his face. If you want to do, you can also do this for digital emphasis. So here it talks about kids and how wonderful band-aids are and they, they, they heal everybody. Uh, you can just kind of take it and make the rest of it black and white, keep that part color. You don't have to do it. You can do pretty much anything. And you can do this even in PowerPoint now. It's pretty darn cool. I can do it. Uh, multiple angles are good. So here we are doing a traction splint and a femur injury. So when you step through this, when you do these photographs, people are not doing this at real time. And that's what you have to work with your, your subjects, your, your, your actors, is that this is not real time. It's, you're gonna step and hold. Okay, keep holding that, keep holding that. All right, do my photographs, different angles. Okay, now do this, all right, different angles. So when we, we photographed this, we didn't have the uh, lower left picture. We just photographed it here straight on for the crank. But at the same time, I came up on top to show you know how they're securing it together. So you wanna photograph multiple angles because you're not gonna be able to see everything from every single angle. But yeah, walking them through it's one of the hardest things because uh, they just want to keep going. So you got to be like, hang on, step by step. It's not a scenario. It's a visual case study that we're, we're creating. After we've done the treatment, we have, of course, we have to evaluate that treatment and look at the reassessment of it and potential complications that they may have. And in this part, um, you know, here as we're switching off onto a non breather, this again, I like to, you know, have them smile. Uh, you know, have them and one picture him smile and then have him picture look concerned. That way it's, it's, are my treatments working or are my treatments not working? Again, you make up the story, you drive where it's going, but keep these in your library. You have people shoot as many different angles, as many different emotions as you can. Always like to um, have different techniques. Again, this was not even, this kid wasn't even, uh, one of the scenarios, it was his sister that you saw with the asthma. That's actually the original uh, slide deck, but her brother was there and it's like, hey, let's have them, let's talk about bag valve mask ventilations. And this has been used a bit. <laughs> Wanna talk about dating yourself? Good old, you know, the easy cap. That's again, that's the problem sometimes when, when you're photographing is when technology changes, it kind of outdates and, or, or uh, dates your, uh, your images. Yeah, this is also a short end of the tube. Men tube is only about this long. He's biting it. They are all dishwasher safe. So after we go through the evaluation, we go to disposition. Here it is. Uh, this is talking about BLS handing off to an ALS provider. So Skip, come on in. You know, let's uh, just stand here and smile. <laughs> Have him talk. Now, I did get in trouble. I kind of chuckle. This is one of the first series of images that I did. 
and her hair is so not what it should be. Uh, she's not a, um, a uh, uh, EMT. She wasn't actually an EMT. Uh, so I just had to come out and put a shirt on and I should have had her tie her hair back. So I learned that now looking back, this is going back many, many, many years uh, to do these. So be aware of that. Uh, I just take pictures of the, of the hospital. This is one of my destination pictures I like to have. Um, I've used this anywhere from destination to, oh, by the way, you've got another call. Here's your dispatch. Air medical. Again, it, it, when you're just, just go out there, take all these photographs. Build up. This is my rural hospital entrance. You know, documentation. Again, I got to update my documentation stuff, but uh, it's fun to show the show the youngins what we used to have to do back in the days. Uh, and this can be used. To, you can utilize this. You can even take a picture of. Uh, I've done this also with um, uh, like like some of the the commercial, the digital uh, documentation, the EMR uh, um, documentations. Uh, and you can like write these letters in there and you could do, okay, here's how you write it. Here's where you put OPQRST and here's how it's written. This is New York state. I don't, are they still being in use up there, James? Oh my gosh. I've been gone for 10 years. No, uh, five, seven years, seven years. Wow. Uh, so yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Good to know they're still being used. Uh, um, so, you know, again, you know, crushing middle of, uh, you know, crushing chest pain, you can use this to, be, to reinforce different parts. Again, this whole thing is based on what you want to do. Because the thing is, in these cases can be as simple as you want to as complex as you want. You know, a simple review may just be a simple airway placement. So you can begin and end anywhere and cheated, and you can end anywhere and cheated. So if I just want to talk about airway management, I could do everything up to the point of, you know, really chief complaint. If all I got to do is airway management, I'm just going to use a C part. I don't need all these yet because everything is handled up in there. Our detailed ones are going to be much more in depth. These are the ones we use for like path specific pathophysiologies uh, for it and to get the differential diagnosis. If you are doing something like this, you can utilize uh, PowerPoint for your storyboard and, and create these, take slides and put chief concern, history, exam, assessment, and do the sub points in there. And that's gonna help you develop your story, help you develop your scenario. And that's what I would do. And then in the bottom side, I'd say, okay, as I'm writing this, I want a photograph of an uh, EMT writing a, a PCR, a nurse reading the PCR or, or doc reading the PCR. So it lets me start to put together what images I'm gonna want for this photo shoot. And then what I would do on some of the complex photo shoots is I had a way to a little form we created with all the equipment that we we're going to need for the photo shoot, any uh, models we're going to use, and then, you know, what was the images I wanted and what is the essential because you may have essential parts of photographs. So if I'm doing um, bag valve mass ventilation uh, under, you know, initial assessment, so, so BVM, you know, I may want to, you know, focus on, on hand placement. So I make sure whatever photograph I have, it's going to reveal that. And then what I would do is take that form and say, okay, here are all the images that I want. And the location is the scene. Because if you ever watch how they make a movie, they don't make a movie linear. They make the movie based on where they are at the time. They'll shoot all the scenes in that one area at once so they don't have to move things. Same thing here is you want to uh, shoot everything. If everything's gonna be in the back of an ambulance, let's say we have a scene, let's say we, we have a house um, and then the ambulance. And uh, so you'll shoot everything in one spot. Uh, especially if it's like, let's say that we say the mechanism, let's say it's a fall instead of a house. So you wanna do all the precipitating issues. So you shoot all the precipitating issues and then you shoot the EMS inside the house. And then you go shoot the ambulance. It's easier than going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So cheated is really a great tool to use because it's going to give you this thing. It's going to give you creative control in terms of the images that you're going to have. And creative control is, is amazing because when you develop your scenario, you want to make a decision. Is it, is it winter or is it summer? Is it 
is it cold? Is it warm? Is it night? Is it is it is it day or is it um, night? Because when you write your scenario, you're going to have to have the images for that, and you really don't want to be in December in Buffalo when and writing a scenario for a a drowning in a nice warm lake. You're not going to be able to photograph it then. So that's the problem that, that you may have is when you write your scenario, write it for when you're going to be photographing um, if it is inv involves environment. And it can also come in handy because it can give us some ideas. It can give us ideas in terms of safety. This is a, a lecture on, on safety and footing. So time of year can be beneficial to utilize where you are. Again, in Buffalo, <laughs> this, is, this is Buffalo in May. And this is Buffalo in June. And then we're back to July. No, just kidding. So, you know, take your pictures. Uh, location is interesting. Uh, this is my doc. I just used this picture the other day. This is a doctor's office. Uh, these are two, two friends when I was a, a flight medic. Uh, he's, he, uh, he's a flight nurse. He's a flight medic. And we needed a doctor's office. So we actually use the pilot's room. And if you look, I've kept this in here because it's kind of funny. If you look really closely here, the only certificate I had to put on a wall was a certified flight paramedic certification on, on the wall. So if you look really closely, it's one of those little uh, nuggets that we throw in once in a while. You know, here we are driving, not really. I'm sitting on the floor and just told my father-in-law, just hold, you know, look as though you're driving and squint because you don't have your glasses on. These are all on vacation one year. I took pictures on vacation. I wrote it off. It's a business trip. Yeah, it didn't flow. It was all free anyways. Um, but, you know, here's the thing. It could be scene safety. It could be ge geriatrics. There's a lot of different uses for this image. So just shoot a lot. Now, you, shooting in hospitals is often forbidden. Um, this is my wife, so I kind of snuck that in. But you really can't take a lot of, you can't take hospital pictures. You need permission to be photographing in a hospital, especially if, if patients. You should never be taking pictures of patients, by the way. Um, it gets into a whole bunch of, of, of not only HIPAA violations, but patient confidentiality issues, but then just model releases. So that's the thing. If you are going to be photographing in a hospital, you need to have permission of the facility as well as the patient and have mod signed model releases. Believe it or not, same thing at work. Uh, some workplaces may frown upon you photographing in the workplace uh, about how their employees are represented and, and how they are dressed. And there is copyright issues that can come into this as well as doing it on work time. So you have to be very cautious and, and work with your uh, company if that's what you want to do. Uh, just have a whole collection of equipment because you never know when you're going to use it or how you're going to use it. Um, like I said, and shoot, if you have uh, avenues to shoot different types of equipment, I would definitely do that because then it depends on what, who you're putting this together for and where they are. Again, technology changes. Um, like Greg had with the plate of seafood, I look down, there's a, here's the bag that we're doing for a photo shoot, just kind of throwing stuff together. I took a picture of it. I can't tell you how many times I've used this bag just to talk about introduction in the treatment or where we're going. I can talk about this in terms of airway management as an introductory slide. It's a placeholder. It's just another image. Pictures, pictures, pictures. Have lots of photographs in your library. You never know when they're gonna come in handy. I've, I can't tell you, I've used this image probably 15 times this year alone. Uh, talking about my pediatrics. So when I go talk about pediatrics, I reinforce the idea of having um, length-based tapes or reference guides uh, to the students. So that's where this comes in handy. I don't talk about them individually. If I was gonna talk about them individually, I would actually have whichever device or whatever piece of equipment I was gonna use and photograph that in multiple different ways. But this is just kind of like my introduction. Or if I just wanna talk about, hey, make sure everything's weight-based. So have lots of equipment. Again, this comes in handy from all different ways. Uh, sometimes when, if you are photographing specific equipment, uh, these folks, these were my emergency medical responders up in um, Welland. They were with uh, um, St. John Ambulance. These folks, these kids were amazing. They knew Sager, but they've never put on a hair traction device. They only had Sager. So it ended up being kind of fun. Is Their, their, their reward is I got to teach them a new 
uh, piece of equipment. And, uh, and my re reward was a, gr a great group to be in a set of photographs. So you may have to teach the equipment to whoever that you're working for. Um, providers is always a good thing. Now, the thing is, is this guy right here, you know, because this is the fall off the ladder. When we weren't photographing with this, with this view, when we were photographing just the leg, I had him stand up. I took the collar off. As long as I'm not photographing up at that end, you know, I put a pillow under him, we were happy. So keep people comfortable because if they're in, in positions too long, you know, they're going to get uh, cranky and they won't want to stay for you. So again, this isn't a real situation. It's not a scenario. It's not a simulation. You control the, you control the story. So how you photograph and the angles you photograph, you can think, think, take things away. So yeah, so this collar came off. He sat up. We had pillows beneath him as we just photographed the, the leg. Uh, be cautious. One of my favorite photographs I use all the time is we were in a driveway right here uh, for, for a motor vehicle crash. Uh, we had a car drive right by us. I actually caught it on, on film, which is perfect. But I'm like, oh, guys, we're, we got to watch our, our backs a little bit. Um, but have all different types of providers involved. Try to look at, you know, um, inclusion. A lot of my photographs here uh, don't have it just based on where I was at the time. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to build a little bit more on. Uh, let the providers know what you'll be doing and where they'll be seeing this. Uh, some people get rather um, self-conscious when they see themselves and give them a heads up ahead of time. Uh, you know, a friend of mine felt, he felt, and she actually, she felt very uncomfortable that she didn't look good in her clothes. They, they seemed a little tight. Kids are wonderful, but we talked about kids and of course us. Uh, tell them if you're going to expose them and what you're going to expose. Uh, now, this is one thing here. When I teach trauma, we talk about trauma naked. This patient should not have it, but I don't want to look at his doodad every single time I have him up on the board. Just more examples of ways we can present patients. Uh, you may not want to have them, you know, show you the, the, the middle finger at all. That's probably not an ideal situation. So there's just a lot of different other people that have it. But the one thing I do want to talk about are your image sources. Yes, the internet is a great place to grab images, but pretty much everything is copyrighted uh, unless it is in the public domain. Uh, and just because it is a state entity doesn't mean that it is public domain. Look at the photo use policies and they'll explain to you what you can and can't do. And all of these sites will have that. And it is your um, obligation to look for those, to search those out. Because some of these photographs may not be owned by that entity. So be aware of that. And that's a whole fair use and copyright is a whole nother lecture that I talk about. Stock images are nice, but everybody uses them. But putting together your own image bank is great. And if you share it between instructors and, and give each other permission to use it, it's even more. So folks, that's pretty much what I have in terms of visual case studies. Be creative is one of the biggest things. Are there any questions? I just want to say we definitely have some time to take some questions. And as those roll in, I just wanted to uh, mention, you talked about using Photoshop a lot for creating some of these images and adding things in digitally afterwards. And one of the biggest problems with Photoshop for people is the like large cost that comes associated with buying a subscription to the Creative Cloud. But I have a link that I'm going to send in the chat. I was looking into it a little bit during the presentation. And Adobe does offer significant discounts for educators and students um, and um, up to 60% off. And I know during COVID they did um, several offers where they were giving you a free um, a free like one year of creative cloud and stuff so definitely keep looking out adobe puts out a lot of offers for discounts for photoshop so if it's something that you want to use uh, there are definitely deals available and if you are if you're associated with a university or even a college or school um either as a student or instructor you can usually get those through them uh, we have a question up in here uh, so why don't they the textbook developers start using these in slides um, for a lot of different reasons. One, it's time, it takes a lot of time to put together. Uh, they don't make money off their slides uh, and then copyright issues. It's very expensive to put. Um, Jones and Barlett's a little bit better, but I've worked with them and it's a little bit hard. Um, thank you, Ruth. 
Uh, I'm glad you all enjoyed. Folks, here's my information. Um, if you have any questions, please, please contact me. Um, maybe one of these days, we'll, you know, Greg and I can resurrect the workshop. It's a full day workshop we did at NAMSI. I think we did it at NAMSI like three years in a row uh, for it. So it's definitely a, uh, it's a lot of fun. GIMP instead of Photoshop. Yeah, there, there is a lot of different options out there. I just always, I've used Photoshop since like version one. Um, so it's been one of those things and I've always been, been lucky to work somewhere that I can get my educational discount. So yeah, the, the, the workshop is a blast. Uh, you actually end up creating your own visual case studies and we haven't done it since really the, I want to say the last time we did it was probably 2012 I'm dating myself. So it'd be interesting to see now that we have, um, camera phones and, and everything like that and, and computers much more than what they were 10 years ago. So that may be interesting. <laughs>